Any other announcements? Uh, if not, Mike Arthur has asked me just to say a few words about the origin of this symposium. Uh, Peter Dynas passed away in 2009, and so that means that most of the graduate students here probably didn't overlap with Peter, and you probably don't know who he is. Um, but let me say some words about Peter, because he was really a wonderful colleague. Uh, Peter was born in Germany, but he was really a Penn Stater through and through. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree at the Friedrich Wilhelms University in Germany, uh, but then came to the United States in the early 1960s to Penn State to get his master's degree and his PhD, which he received in 1967. He was immediately appointed as a faculty member. And from 1967 until his uh, supposed retirement in 2004, Peter was here at Penn State, and he always loved Penn State. Uh, in terms of his research, Peter was internationally renowned for his work in uh, stable uh, oxygen and carbon isotope analyses. Peter established some really iconic databases, extremely robust. He was known all over the world for the meticulousness of his data collection, and uh, his analyses, which were just collected down the hall in his Hawthorne lab, will stand the test of time. Uh, but on top of that, Peter was really dedicated to service and teaching. He was a wonderful teacher of geochemistry, and he was also a really avid volunteer and for all kinds of faculty committees. Uh, he served on over 60 committees during his time here, which I just shudder to think about that. And I got to know Peter a little bit because he was the university ombudsman at the time that I was a college ombudsman. And so we worked together uh, on, on some kind of uh, difficult problems. And I always just found him to be uh, kind of an infinite, infinite resource of university uh, pol policy wisdom. And he was always just a really warm-hearted person. Uh, Peter also served as the associate head for the graduate program from 2000 into, until 2004. And he was really beloved in that role. He was a person that all the grad students found to be really approachable, and uh, he was just an advocate for the graduate students in, in, in just a really wonderful way. And so when Peter passed away from cancer in 2009, the department decided that they were going to memorialize him through an annual uh, lecture uh, given to the top performer in the graduate colloquium series. And this is just a wonderful way to, to offer a living memorial to one of our most esteemed faculty members. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Marone to introduce this to his speaker. Okay, thanks a lot, Peter. Now, let's see now, can Melissa join us here? Peter's wife will be joining us at some point uh, um, today, but I don't see her here right yeah, now. Yeah, we just have to go forward. Yeah, okay. Well, look, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce um, John Lehman, who's uh, the 2016 Dynas Lecture. Um, Peter and uh, and John would have gotten along incredibly well. They both worked at the interface between science and technology. I mean, Peter did all this um, early work on uh, mass specs and um, really pushed the edge in terms of the technology that influenced his science. And John has done the exact same thing. It's everything from building instruments to analog electronics to, to digital signal processing. Um, and John's going to tell you a fair bit about that today in the, in the context of his talk about slow earthquakes. Um, John's academic background um, is in geology and geophysics and, and meteorology. He has actually has two bachelors of science degrees from the University of Oklahoma in geophysics and in meteorology. And um, he, um, he's also e equally broad in terms of his interest in technology, just in having built tilt meters and having built uh, the kinds of things that he's going to tell you about today. So it's been very, very impressive to see the things that he's done. He's been incredibly productive since he's been here. Um, he's, in, he's been here for about three years. He's published three first author papers. The most recent one came out of Nature Communication just a few days ago. And he's also published things online in, in electronics journals and, and design things. He's, he's one of these people who's just been incredibly productive. He's worked with a broad range of people here at Penn State. Um, he works with Sridhar, he works with Richard Alley, he works with uh, David Safer, he works with me. Um, every student at some point in PhD makes a transition from the advisee to the advisor a little bit. And John, I think, has made that transition faster than most of our students. I mean, I feel like I, I'm his advisor, but most of the time I'm not sure who's doing the advising, if it's him or me. So, um, it's, it's been really a pleasure getting to know and working with John. Um, 
Before I turn it over to uh, John for his actual talk, I'd like to acknowledge and introduce his mom and dad who are here, his family, his wife, Linda, is here as well, so please welcome them, and, um, and I will uh, turn things over to John. So, thank you, John. Let's welcome John. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, for that really great introduction. And before we get into anything about slow earthquakes or frictional dynamics, I have to say thank you to a lot of people, some of which are up here, some of which aren't. None of what you're about to see would be possible without any of these people. Those that are on my committee have dedicated an amazing amount of time to working with me on these results. And there are a lot of professors that are not on my committee that have donated their time and patience and expertise for a lot of the problems that you're going to see also had the pleasure while here of working with some of the best grad students around. These folks that are up here, a lot of them from my cohort, some of them already gone, some still here, and a lot of the new folks really push me every day to do my best. And so thanks to all those folks, and then of course my family who traveled up, and my wife, and without any of them, none of this would be possible at all. So thanks to all of you. All right, what we're going to talk about today are slow earthquakes. And I'm going to start off with a very general, general introduction for those of you that may not be familiar with me. Slow earthquakes are a type of earthquake we learned about in about the last 15 years. As their name implies, they are a stress release, a strain release in the earth, but they occur over a longer period of time or with a different uh, frequency of radiation. So here we have the Pacific Northwest. You can see we've got uh, Victoria going down past Seattle, Portland. This is a map of tremor so very small, low frequency events that migrate. The cool colors are December of last year, the warm colors are just earlier this month. So you see we have these little tremors migrating at rates of kilometers a day. And on earthquakes we normally think about things working at kilometers a second. So why are these so slow and what's their significance? In fact, we'll talk about this plot a little bit later, but if you drop a GPS station, there we go, if you drop the GPS station down, and monitor its displacement up here, you'll actually see this sawtooth pattern that we would normally uh, associate with earthquakes and this stress rebound process, but these stress drops last over the period of days to weeks. So they're much, much longer, and they're accompanied with all this tremor. You may say, well, these are slow, we didn't know about them until recently, and they don't produce seismic shaking, so why do we even care about them? Well, as you know, this area experienced a very large earthquake in 1700 created a devastating tsunami in Japan. And so every three to 500 years, we get a large earthquake here. Slow earthquakes can change the stress field and either do a clock advance or a clock retard on those kind of large earthquakes. So understanding the interplay between slow earthquakes and normal earthquakes is really important to understanding how the seismic hazard can vary through time in areas like this. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the general three-prong approach that a lot of experimentalists will take. We're gonna iterate over pieces of it a couple of times today. First, I'm going to show you some examples. Maybe not. First, I'm going to show you some examples from nature. We'll look around the world at the natural habitat of slow earthquakes. After all, we're trying to explain the natural problems. Then we're going to look at some theory. We want to know what physics govern these. So we'll look at uh, some simple numerical models, and maybe a couple that aren't quite so simple. And then we'll go to the laboratory we can take what we learned from the theory, do some experiments, and try to connect it back to nature, and this entire process is repeated several times to produce what you're gonna to see today. So in the most, most general sense, earthquakes generally occur at plate boundaries. So uh, spreading centers or subduction zones, uh, wide bands of seismicity, or transforms. You'll notice though that there are some places where there are plate boundaries in these dozen or so major tectonic plates, but there are gaps in seismicity because faults don't only fail in this earthquake mechanism. Faults can also creep. So this is some experimental data, but it's just a, mostly here to serve as schematic. We're looking at time on the x-axis and shear stress on the fault here on the y. So as the plates move, we build shear stress on the fault, and it approaches some failure stress, where at some point the fault starts to slide, it starts to creep. This is an aseismic process. It doesn't produce any seismic radiation, and we stay near this failure stress the entire time. So that doesn't produce any immediate seismic hazards, but there are some hazards to our infrastructure. A nice example of that, so here we've got Oakland, Berkeley, California Memorial Stadium, that's that little oval. If we zoom in, you see the Hayward Fault runs directly through the stadium, 
and it's actually shearing the stadium at about 0.2 inches a year. So that's causing some pretty major structural problems for them. You can go elsewhere in town, and our clicker's not gonna work today. You can go elsewhere in town and see you know, places where curves are offset as well, so you can have this creep in fault trace pretty easily. Faults also behave in the earthquake mode, though. This is the one that most of us in the room are generally interested in, especially the seismologists, where shear stress builds up on the fault, and then when it reaches that failure point, instead of just beginning to slide, there's a sudden release of stress, we call, say, stress drop. And we don't know exactly how much of the total stress on the fault is released there, but some decent percentage. And this sharp, rapid time change of stress, we get emitted elastic radiation. That's what we pick up on our seismometers, that's what shakes the ground and knocks buildings down. That's what a lot of us think about. So we conceptualize these things as what are called a stick-slip process. This was first brought up in this issue of Science in August of 1966 by Grayson Byerly saying, shallow focus earthquakes may represent stick-slip during sliding along old or newly formed faults in the earth. Now this repeating earthquake process connecting it to stick-slip was a really important step because that allowed us to connect to the literature from the engineers, because engineers think about stick slip a lot. It's tool chatter, it's bearing squeal, it's all kinds of engineering problems. And we can connect to that now pretty easily and it gives us a way to model the system. So we've always thought of these two modes of fault failure. Stable creep, a seismic creep where we're shearing the stadium, and unstable seismic failure where we're knocking buildings down. If we want to make a model of this system, let's look at a really, really simple model, a spring slider model. So we've got a motor that's gonna represent plate movement. We've got a spring that represents the elastic rocks in the fault zone. The rocks have some kind of elastic constant. And then we have a slider sliding along this track with our little experimental fault here. I'm actually gonna show you, we can build this in the lab. There's two really quick videos. In this first video, turn the motor on. There's no spring in here. It's just the stiffness of the, the string. So it's a pretty stiff system and the block slides along. So that's very simple analog for a seismic failure. Now in this experiment you can see I put a spring in. So when I start the same process and the system has been de-stiffened by the spring, you see that we get this stick slip motion. So this is the laboratory analog of repeating earthquakes. And we can change the stiffness and change all kinds of properties of these little laboratory events. But that's a really simple model and this is what we want to explain. This is complicated, this is three-dimensional. There's heterogeneity everywhere, and it's definitely not a little block of granite. Westerly granite, by the way, on the tabletop. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of where maybe this aseismic seismic model is not gonna hold up so well. First, we'll start out with where I had on the, the tidal slide in the Pacific Northwest. So we have the one Fuca plate that's abducting between the North American plate here, and if we put a GPS station right here in Victoria, <coughs> we get that sawtooth pattern that I talked about. We're gonna look at it a little bit more closely though. What we're seeing is that the North American plate is deforming eastward over a period of about 14 months, as this pl the one who plate is abducting beneath it, and then slides back westward about a centimeter over the period of 14 days or so, so two weeks. This is a magnitude seven earthquake just drawn out over a much longer period of time. Another place we can see something very similar we go around to New Zealand, we had Laura Wallace here a couple of months ago that talked about this and showed some very interesting results from the, the Hobbits experiment here. We'll look at the <coughs> North Island of New Zealand mostly. If we look at a GPS station here, so again, subduction in this direction, this PAEK GPS station shows a very similar signal. It's going westward with subduction and then sliding back eastward. You'll notice that these are a lot longer. These slow earthquakes, these slow slip events, last about a year each, and they have multiple years in the inner seismic period though. But this is one of the better instrumented places right now. And the last example is one of my favorites because it's a non-tectonic example. So non-tectonic earthquakes should still follow the same physics as a tectonic earthquake. We wouldn't expect frictional dynamics, the, the laws to change. If you have to change based on where you are on the globe, then something's wrong with the theory. So here we're gonna look in Antarctica, look in the, the western portion where 90% of the interior ice accumulation is discharged through only 10% of the coastline area. 
through ice streams, so really fast moving regions of ice that move ice from the interior out to the shelf. We're talking a couple hundred meters a year of movement on these ice streams, so very, very fast. And our own Triyananda Krishna has put uh, GPS stations and all kinds of other instruments on these. This is some of his data from November of 2003. And we're looking at displacement uh, just downstream here. For several days, you can see that twice a day, the ice stream slips. It's moving about a meter a day, and it's doing so over a period of about 30 minutes. So this is a slow earthquake, I believe around magnitude six or so, but it does emit a little bit of seismic radiation, so it's definitely not as fast as we would consider a normal rupture to be. So what these three examples show us is that this is not a complete picture at all. That there's a lot of things, I should have made this gray, I guess, I could say in the gray area, but there's a lot of things in the green area in between here that are these slow events. We, this has been hinted at in the literature for a while. So this is a Schultz 1998, pretty famous paper and figure here. We're looking at a subduction zone. So this is the downgoing plate and this pink area being where earthquakes typically occur. So we're in that uh, five or 10 to 35 kilometer depth range here. And on the transition on either end to stable, there's a very small patch, a yellow in this figure, of conditional stability. And we didn't really understand what the role of conditional stability would be. Does that just mean that a rupture can propagate through a conditionally stable area but can't nucleate in it? Or what exactly is that going to play? Well, it turns out that is going to be really important because where we observe most of these slow events is at the up and down dip ends of the stability transition, mostly in the down dip right now. Another interesting result that we're going to look at a lot is this plot that uh, seismologists have made. And there's a lot of terms on here that you may not be familiar with, so we're going to add a lot of producer marks. On the x-axis, we've got seismic moment, uh, but you can just think of it as magnitude. So I put some magnitudes up here at the top, going from magnitude one to seven, roughly. On the y-axis, we have duration of the event in log seconds. And once again, 10 to the six seconds doesn't mean a lot. So here we've got from less than a second to about a year with these fiducial markers. Normal earthquakes, when we plot them on this plot, tend to plot there, along this red trace, where the moment or the energy released by them is proportional to the cube of how long they last. So about a minute or so for some pretty large events, six, seven events. Slow earthquakes, on the other hand, tend to plot along the green line, where the moment is linearly proportional to their duration. And this gap in here, there's a lot of argument right now about whether it's real or whether it's going to be filled in with increased observations. Are, are we missing some magnitude sixes that last an hour. But that still doesn't change the fact that there is this scaling difference in the events that we can observe well now. So what does that mean? What could that tell us about how these events propagate? How are they different? There are a lot of reasons out there that people have proposed for why slow earthquakes exist, why the fault just doesn't have a normal earthquake or a creep. Uh, one of the highly favored ones is high pore pressure. You increase the pore pressure, you reduce the effective normal stress on the fault, and you can move it with less driving stress. Another one is designer friction. So this is, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but that just means everybody's heard of velocity dependent friction. This is velocity dependence of velocity dependence. So it's a, a third order term out there, a little bit hard to wrap your head around. But there is some laboratory evidence that this happens for a variety of materials. That connects well to the last one of material properties. A lot of times people talk about clays and clay reactions as playing major roles in the stability, especially at subduction zones. So as you can see, this is a really huge problem, and we can't tackle nearly all aspects, definitely not one PhD, and definitely not in 45 minutes. So we're gonna look at three main questions. First, what does the stability field actually look like of a fault zone? What controls the stability, and how it's going to behave? Also, then, can we reproduce slow earthquakes in the laboratory? It's really important for us to be able to make these over and over and observe many of them up close because seismologically, there are some limitations by looking at things, especially deep events that are 40 kilometers down. And then what can we say from those laboratory experiments about the scaling uh, relations that I just showed and the slip velocities? Why are these so slow? Why do they not rupture at kilometers a second? So the first problem, what does the stability field actually look like? Here we have to do the rate and state friction primer. So there's a lot of terms on here for people that are more familiar but I'm gonna go over the basics of what you need to know. All three of these plots 
have fault displacement on the x-axis and friction on the y. On the left side here, I'm showing what we call a velocity step. So we're pushing our fault at one speed, and then I suddenly increase the speed at which it's being driven. And there's this transient friction response. So this spike is the transient, and then a new steady state. In this plot, the new steady state friction is lower at a higher driving velocity. So that means the faster we push the fault, the weaker the fault gets, the easier it is to push faster. So that would nucleate unstable behavior. On the rightmost plot, we have the opposite of that. We have velocity strengthening. So the faster we push it, the harder it is to push, and that would tend to a rest rupture. In the middle, we have velocity neutral, which most things we see in the lab are at least slightly velocity strengthening or weakening. But this is a possibility. And these A minus B numbers down here, just for those of you familiar with the rate and state friction relations. All right, but that's not enough. We also need to know something about the stiffness of the system. Just knowing that the system is velocity weakening does not guarantee that it's going to have unstable or earthquake-like behavior. So we're gonna go back, look at the simple spring slider model again, and do a little bit more in-depth analysis. On this plot, we've got slip of our fault and force, so how hard we're, we're pulling the spring. So the force is going up, and then we start the slip and go down. So there's our little stress drop. The stiffness of the spring governs how fast energy can be unloaded out of that stored spring, the stored energy in that spring, onto fault zone. So if it were stiffer, this red line would be steeper and it means that you cannot release energy out of the spring faster than the fault zone can get weaker. So you're still gonna have creep behavior, even if the system is velocity weakening. But if that spring is really compliant, meaning that a uh, very large displacement results in a relatively small change in the force it's exerting, we can get this green area here that's all excess energy that's available to accelerate the system. That's where we get the stick slip motion. So there's a stiffness transition where below that stiffness, the system can be unstable in most earthquakes. Above it, it's stable. And we talk about that in terms of K sub C, the critical stiffness, which is a function of the normal stress and then the rate and state constitutive parameters. So A minus B and B sub C. We're gonna talk a lot about stiffness for the rest of the talk. So I want to show you, I'm gonna show it in some funny units. We all are familiar with the, the Hooke's Law representation. Force is linear proportional to the displacement, and we've stretched and compressed springs and grafted before. But I'm gonna be talking about things, what we could talk about in terms of shear stress, being proportional to the displacement on our little experimental fault, S sub LP. But I do experiments at a lot of different normal stresses. So I'm gonna go ahead and normalize that, divide by the normal stress. And so I'm actually, I have a friction change here. So everything I'm going to show you is stiffness in terms of friction per displacement. So the units are a little bit funny, but it's still a force per displacement. Okay, so what does that stability field really look like? That's the question we set off to answer before we had all this background. In an ideal world, this is what it would look like. If you have the stiffness of the system and the critical stiffness, when that ratio is over one, you would be stable. And that's for any velocity perturbation you put on your fault, a seismic creep and below that, it would be unstable. We would have earthquakes. And that would be the end of the story, but it's not nearly that simple, thanks to the second and third order effects of friction, like rate and state friction. So we get something that looks a little bit more like this. And this is a lot more interesting problem to work with. For k over k sub c greater than one, we're still stable most of the time, unless you kick the system really hard, unless you give it a very large perturbation, it needs to be unstable for a very short period of time. For k over k sub c of much less than one, it's unstable no matter what kind of perturbation you put on it. But in k over k sub c very close to one, and for small to moderate perturbations, you can actually get quasi-dynamic failure. So it's not quite stable, it's not quite unstable, and that's where all of these slow slip events are gonna lie. That's the interesting part we must stick in, in the rest of the talk. So we've observed complex behavior before in the lab but it hasn't really been systematically investigated. So in the 70s, Schultz saw some gradual, this is a, a time displacement plot for his faults, some gradual accelerations. Uh, in the 90s, Bomberger and coworkers did some work actually with uh, paper, a you know, spring slider system very much like the one that we've looked at. Uh, and they saw some interesting transitions from about stable to some kind of unstable behavior. 
And then very recently, Matt Akari, uh, from here from Penn State, actually has done some work shearing intact cores that were covered by ocean drilling. And they saw, they were shearing these at plate rate, by the way, and they saw these slow slip instabilities spontaneously nucleating. But the problem is, these are spontaneous events in just a couple. You can't get many, many of them to do analysis on. And it's pretty hard to reproduce when you only have one core. Okay, so that takes us to can we make these in the lab? Can we figure out what the controls are that we need to make <coughs> slow events occur? So I do this, of course, with the BIACs. I think a lot of people here are familiar with it. We're gonna go through a really quick rundown, if you're not. This is what it looks like up on the fifth floor. This is the BIACs. And then we've got a lot of supporting and data recording equipment over here, which I will try to stay out of the details of too much. So we'll go with the simple schematic. There was no person in that photo to show you the scale, so I put a banana here. This is a pretty big machine, and it can exert about a meganewton of force with each of these two hydraulic pistons. A meganewton is not a very intuitive number for most people. We don't think in newtons. So that is like stacking seven fully loaded school buses. So a gross vehicle weighs 20,000 pounds or so on the side of this little experimental fault. And that experimental fault is four inches by four inches. So it's a lot of force. We can simulate pretty deep conditions here. We measure that force with load cells that are attached to the ends of the hydraulic rams. So these just tell us how much force or stress, depending on how we do the conversion, is on each axis. And then we use DCDTs, or direct current displacement transducers, to measure where the pistons are in space. So those just give us a readout of how many millimeters we've moved our experimental fault. We can also control off of either of those. So I can tell the biax to maintain a constant load or maintain a constant rate of displacement, a constant shear rate. If we zoom into the, the center portion of the biax here, the sample area, this is what we see. This is what our experimental setup actually looks like. It's called the double direct shear configuration which just means that we have two layers of fault gouge here and here, so ground up powder in this case, and three steel blocks that we sandwiched in the between. Uh, they've got some ridges on them to make sure that we actually get good coupling into the material. We apply a constant normal stress, we let everything compact until we're ready to go, and then we shear the center block down at a constant displacement rate. Generally, <coughs> we're talking something like a few microns a second, maybe 100 microns not plate rates, that would take a really long time, but we're looking at something that's nucleation block. And it looks something like this animation that was produced at great expense to shear down here. In real life, though, this is what it really looks like. So there should be a couple things you should say, wait a second, you said steel blocks, and this is not steel. But we'll get to that in a couple of slides. We add a lot of extra instrumentation that wasn't in that slide because we're discovering the more and more that we can measure directly on the fault zone, we're getting some really interesting results. So the first thing I do is measure displacement. Uh, we call it onboard. It basically just means I'm not measuring the displacement of this piston up here and then correcting for the stiffness of the biax because the biax stretches when we put force on the system and maybe does that in ways we don't totally understand. So I don't have to correct for that. I'm measuring directly from here, at the top of the center block on our fault, to the base plate of this biax with this transducer. On the back side of this, which you can't see in the photo, there's another setup that's identical that actually measures from the bottom of our experimental fault down here. So we can do things like calculate the strain of the block, the velocity of the fault, and get a lot of interesting results from that. Uh, we also measure acoustic travel time. This is work that our postdoc Jacques Rivière is doing a lot of wonderful things with right now by looking at what's the P wave velocity through this fault zone by using these lead zirconate titanate transducers across here. And then we've recently started measuring shear heating. So I actually embed two thermistors of about a millimeter and a half, and maybe three millimeters, in one of these steel side blocks away from the fault zone and look at the heat that's generated from each individual slip event. Now remember, we're slipping at microns a second and maybe under a pretty decent load, but that's not much heat. We're still looking at millikelvin level. And now let's just get a little bit more about the energy budget. Okay, I am going to show you only one experiment that is not run 
with this material we call Minusil, and I will point it out when we get there. But everything else is run with Minusil, which is just ground up quartz. It's, a, it's an engineering material. We use it because it's very reproducible. We can buy it in five gallon buckets. In fact, that's the smallest size you can buy it in. And it's very well controlled. So we have this nice particle size distribution, a mean, mean grain size of about 10 microns or so. This is what it looks like under SEM. So it's this nice angular, very regular quartz, and it's 99.9% .9 pure. We also know that quartz does play a role in subduction zones. Our Don Fisher and Sue have done some wonderful work looking at uh, crack healing with this. So after we shear our experimental fault zone, it looks like this. You can see that center block has been pushed down from where it started. And the wonderful thing is, you can't do this with nature, we can pull the fault apart and look at it and analyze it. So if I separate right on this plane here and look normal for the fault, this is what you see. These dark ridges here are actually the surface intersection of Riddell shear planes that are dipping into the fault. So these are shear surfaces that are accommodating all of the fault deformation. You can actually see, not in the photo on the projector, but there are little you know, laboratory slicken lines on there. We can either collect those intact if we're very careful, epoxy them, then section them and look at them in different types of microscopy to learn a little bit about these shear plane orientations, or we can just scrape all the material off, collect it, and look at the particle size distribution to see how much energy is going into crushing. And once again, helpful is the energy budget. Okay, this is the, uh, the plot that I told you that's not with Minucel, after we just talked about it. This is actually with baking flour, like you would make a cake with, and it's for a completely non-related project, but it so happened to have favorable frictional properties that by just changing what these uh, forcing blocks are made out of in our setup, we can change the entire behavior of the system. So this top line, it's stable sliding, it's creeping, and it's with all steel, so we're in a very stiff system. <coughs> the middle experiment, I changed out the center block for one made out of acrylic, so we de-stiffened the system, and under the exact same conditions, now we get, these are actually pretty slow slip events, uh, but we get slow behavior. Then I replace all three of the blocks in this experimental setup with acrylic, so I, I further de-stiffen the system, and we get larger slip events with a longer recurrence interval. And these actually had a significantly higher peak slip velocity. So these are going more unstable or more towards a, a normal laboratory earthquake. So that's really interesting. And we thought, well, it's great to be able to modulate the stiffness of the system, but only having three positions on the dial is a little bit crude. We want to see what happens in there. And we don't want to have to take a bunch of different plastics and different things to make springs out of because we don't want to deal with the interactions that there could be and when you get really compliant plastics, they just won't hold up to the load that you need to apply. So the other way that we could change the stiffness, or at least the stiffness ratio, where we are in stability space, is by changing the normal stress on the system, so changing how hard we squeeze for the entire experiment. If you remember from that equation for the critical stiffness, or where this change in behavior occurs, normal stress is on the right side numerator. So if I increase the normal stress, then I can increase the critical stiffness. And by doing that, I decrease the stability of the parameter, K over K sub C. So the main thing to take away from this is increasing the normal stress makes the system less stable, more likely to have earthquakes. So now we have two knobs that we can turn to control the stability of the system. So doing that, we actually were able to create slow slips in the lab that lasted for seconds which is huge because a normal laboratory stick slip event lasts for a few milliseconds and then it's over. This is a very small fault. We don't get all these nice propagation effects like we do uh, in nature. This is an experiment with that quartz gouge with Minucil. We start loading, we reach yield and slide along. And then if we zoom into this gray box, you see from stable sliding, we spontaneously get this sinusoidal oscillation that begins and grows over maybe a dozen or so cycles. Those are really small, really slow laboratory stick slip events. They grow to some steady state out here. Uh, we've zoomed in out here a little bit so you can see more clearly three of them. And we've got a time displacement plot for this curve. So you can see that the fault zone accelerates, we get our slip event, and then very rapidly decelerates and stops with very little creep. 
So the answer is yes, absolutely, we can recreate these slow slope events in the lab. We can do it in a very reproducible way. Though to do that, we ended up having to control for everything, including the humidity of the environment these experiments were run in. So there's a lot of uh, pathological factors that we have to really track down to get this to be that reproducible. So now we're in this situation. Uh, we can create these, but we need to quantify what we're seeing. So we need to know the stiffness of this system that we've created, the, the complex biax plus quartz gouge plus acrylic blocks. And we also need to know the critical stiffness so we can calculate that stability ratio. So to do that, if the experiment is stable sliding, if it's creeping, or we don't have any earthquakes, the only way to know what its stiffness is reliably is to unload, so to remove the vertical stress and then reapply it. When we do that, we get these loop looking things here. And the slope of that is a friction per displacement. So if we <coughs> pick somewhere here in the center, fit a straight line, that tells us the stiffness of the system. There are a few disadvantages here though. One, as you can see, the act of doing this unload and reload lets some frictional healing occur and disturbs our experiment for a couple millimeters of shear afterwards. Also, it's not a very dense spatial sampling. I'm only doing this about every five or so millimeters here. So we don't get a good idea of how the stiffness is evolving throughout the entire experiment. But for experiments that have laboratory earthquakes, we can fit a straight line to this loading part of each event, and that gives the stiffness as well. So that gives a really dense spatial sampling. But now there's this question of are we comparing apples and oranges here? We're measuring stiffness in two different ways. So we ran this exact experiment to address that question, where we had unstable events, we could use that method, and we did unload reloads. Comparing those results, the unload reload cycles are the gray dots, the stiffness from each laboratory earthquake is a blue dot, you see they're, they're pretty close. And this is a very small scale. You're looking at stiffnesses here uh, that are you know, that part in 10,000 one over microns. So they're very close, looks like we can compare these, no problems, that's good news. Okay, what about K sub C? Well, to get K sub C, we need to know these rate and state friction parameters. We know the normal stress, we apply that. But these are a little bit trickier. So what we do is in an experiment that's stable sliding, we can perform some of those velocity steps that we talked about earlier in the rate and state friction introduction. Where I push the system at one velocity, and then here I suddenly increase the velocity. All the gray dots are laboratory data from one experiment, and then the black line is an actual model fit. So we take the rate and state equations, we do a singular value decomposition and invert, and fit this <coughs> model. So we can get that, no problems, and calculate the critical stiffness. We do that for multiple displacements in a single experiment, and we can see how the critical stiffness evolves with time. So this is pretty interesting. Before five millimeters, you see there's nothing plotted. And that's because the critical stiffness would actually be negative. It's a rate strengthening material at that point, and we can't get a stiffness of the physical system below a negative stiffness. So there's no way we're gonna get any unstable behavior there. But after a little bit of shear, we get some fabric developing, the critical stiffness starts rising in this asymptotic fashion when you get out here to 40 or 50 millimeters. Relatively flat, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of seven per 10,000 one over microns. And so we know what that looks like. Now we have everything we need to plot a lot of experiments. There's a lot of data on this plot, so we're gonna go through it a little slowly. There's about 50 experiments in here. Now a lot of stick slope events, maybe 5,000 or so in there. That's why it looks like a field of red. On the top plot here, we have load point displacement, or how far our fault has slid in millimeters, and the stiffness of the system. Each of the black dots is from an unload reload cycle and represents a stable experiment. So no matter what we did to these, we could kick them with reasonable velocity perturbations. They've just crept. All of the red dots are from stiffnesses from individual laboratory earthquakes. So they were definitely unstable. The black line that you see here that does a pretty good job of separating them is our best estimate of K sub C with displacement. And that's fit with just a very simple rate and state model. So what's really cool about this is that line does a great job of separating these two fields. And it's a model that is completely empirical. It has no uh, inertia in it, so it's a massless system. It has no radiation damping in it. And it does that good of a job on a real three-dimensional laboratory system, it's amazing. But this plot makes things look a little bit 
black and white. They're either unstable or they're stable. We know that's not the case. So if we zoom in on this 18 to 50 millimeter range here, and I'm gonna plot it now as K over K sub C. So remember one would be above that, things should be stable. Below that, they should be increasingly unstable. And I've colored each event by its peak slip velocity. So how fast the fault moved during the experiment, during the laboratory earthquake. So the red dots, it's not moving much faster than what we're pushing at. We're pushing at 10 microns a second. Maybe the fault slips at 80. That's a laboratory slow slip event. As we get further and further down though, the colors get cooler, indicating peak slip velocities up to around four millimeters a second. And that acceleration occurs very fast. We actually hear those in the laboratory as audible, bang, 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 because the acceleration is so fast. So we're spanning the realm here from laboratory slow <coughs> earthquakes to laboratory fast earthquakes. We've reproduced the entire spectrum. This is what we typically call a run plot. So we still have fault displacement on the X and friction on the Y for nine experiments. I put the kappa ratio on here in case you're interested. Main thing is we're going from less stable to more stable with, remember, high normal stresses should be less stable. So up there at the top, we have very fast events. We can hear those. Those are our laboratory normal earthquakes. At the bottom, we have very small laboratory slow events. A few things stand out about this plot just immediately almost when you see it. The first one is this, the closer you are to stability, the later in the experiment we see this spontaneous behavior emerge. We think that has to do with fabric development. So at the higher normal stresses, it's a lot easier to rotate things and get a fabric to develop earlier in the experiment than down here at lower normal stresses like six meters. The most interesting feature I'd argue about all of this really is that it emerges from a stable sliding behavior and evolves for these dozen or so events. We're not, there's no perturbation here that we can control. There may be some small stochastic natural perturbation, but we think that we're driving the fault at the exact same velocity. And then when we're very close to the stability boundary, so way down here at K over K sub C of 0.99, we get this really interesting amplitude modulation behavior where the amplitude of the stick slip events goes up and down over and over. It looks kind of like a, a beating signal. So we're still unclear whether that's interaction between these two layers in our experimental fault zone or this is some kind of feedback <coughs> mechanism that's trying to work and keep the system right at the stability boundary. It's something we have to do a lot more investigation on, but it's a reproducible thing. And it's even been reproduced in other labs that have been working on this exact problem. Another really interesting behavior we see, here we have what we call period doubling. So we've got this small event, a large event, small event, a large event, repeating. That's observed in nature. We know that some real faults do this. And numerical models can do it too. This is a numerical model uh, from Gu et al. in 84. This is a two-state variable model, which just means that they've got some additional free parameters. So of course you can get a little bit more complicated behavior out of it. But at a K over K sub C value of 0.86, they see this period doubling. That's almost exactly where we are in K over K sub C space in the experiments as well. So the fact that we can reproduce complex behaviors that we see in nature and that models predict in the lab tells us we're on the right track to getting the full spectrum of behaviors in the lab. But this is also from their paper. They mapped out the stability field. It's the same diagram that I showed you earlier schematic form. Over here, stable for high K over K sub C and reasonable perturbations. Unstable here. And then the middle, this region of permanently sustained oscillation. And they mapped this out with, as you can see, about a dozen models or so here. And that's because at the time, the computing was not able, they weren't able to do a lot of these models. Now, with a multi-core desktop iMac, we can run about 200,000 models in an afternoon. So I'm going to show you two of 200,000 models that are really interesting. And they're gonna be at a K over K sub C value of one and 0.8. So for the 0.8 case, we're below the stability boundary, so we know that we should be unstable, we should expect to see earthquakes from this model, and any perturbation on this system, a one nanosecond hold, anything, will eventually cause this growing instability out of what looks like stable sliding. And we eventually go completely unstable, because remember this model doesn't have doesn't have anything like that in 
So eventually it blows up. It has full instability. The peak slip velocity on the fault increases and the inner seismic velocity decreases. So we're increasing the locking and we're going faster and faster. This looks like a lot like what we see in the lab, this emergent behavior. And we actually talked about this a little bit at lunch. Uh, everybody was warned that there's going to be phase plots in this talk. So if you remember from differential equations looking at phase plots, that's great. You're all set. If you don't, we're going to do the 30 second primer. On the x-axis, we have the logarithm of the velocity that the fault is sliding at divided by the velocity that we're pushing. So above zero, the fault's moving faster than we're driving it. Below zero, the fault's moving slower than we're pushing it. And at zero, it's moving at 10 microns a second when I'm driving it at. On the y-axis is friction. So the same y-axis is here. And then this velocity information is now encoded on the x. So what this emergence of instability looks like is a spiraling outward from the center. If this were a stable system, we'd call it the strong attractor if you're doing stability analysis. But in this case, we're spiraling out. The stress drops are getting larger and larger and our velocity difference is getting higher and higher. Okay, the other model that we wanted to look at is K over K sub C of one. So we're at the stability boundary. We are exactly on it. When we run that model, any perturbation we can get these repeating events that go on for as long as we want to run the model. It never blows up. And they're roughly sinusoidal, so they look pretty similar to what we've seen in the laboratory later on in the experiments. And they have peak slip velocities that aren't all that high, maybe an order of magnitude higher than what we're driving at. In phase space, it just traces out this phase A shape, and it keeps tracing itself over and over and over again. So we never go unstable. say that we can explain our experimental data with these two models. Early on in the experiment, the critical stiffness is rising very rapidly due to fabric formation. The stiffness of the system is rising, but it's still very low. So we have a K over K sub C ratio that is below 1. 0.8 is not an unreasonable assumption. That's why we did the model there. So we get this spiraling outward behavior from the model that indicates emergence of slow slip. That's what we see in the lab. Later on in the experiment, though, with more shear, K sub C pretty much stops growing. And the stiffness of the system continues to increase very slightly until K over K sub C is pretty much right at the stability boundary or very near it, which is this model. So we begin to go unstable, but before we get there, the stiffness of our system limits us to be forever caught in this limit cycle and not go fully unstable. So that's how we can get slow events in the laboratory. I can measure one of these phase plots in the lab thanks to these onboard transducers and plotting with the exact same code so it looks the same. You see we've got four stress drops. The velocity, of course, is a little randier because this is real data, but not much faster than what we're driving at. And focus on the green line on the phase plot. You'll see it traces out a very similar phase A shape. The red line has to do with uh, strain in the block. And it's a really, uh, really fun story to get into, but we're not going to have time. So some important summary plots about these experiments are <coughs> that the slip duration, how long our event lasts, scales with velocity. For high K over K sub C, or stable, uh, or near that, they're very long, a second or so in the lab, which is an eternity. Then unstable, as we go down in K over K sub C, they become much shorter. We also know that the peak slip velocity scales with where we are in this space as well. The more unstable we are, the higher the peak slip velocity. When we get down here below K over K sub C of about 0.75, <coughs> that acceleration gets fast enough that we hear it in the lab as uh, audible events. So we know that the stiffness and the size of the event, or the friction drop, are related. Uh, so stable down here, unstable up here. We can argue about the scaling. Maybe there's an interesting kink here. Maybe we need to run another experiment there and see if that's real. That's probably the case. Uh, but we know for way down here, we have no friction drop. We're completely stable increasingly unstable. So in the last five minutes or so, I want to talk about this last fundamental question of can we explain the scaling relation that we looked at way back and the propagation velocity. So we've looked at some physics, we've looked at some laboratory data, and now what does that actually mean for anything in real life, or does it 
So this is the plot that we looked at earlier. Just to remind you, normal earthquakes, the moment tends to scale with the cube of the duration. Slow earthquakes, the moment looks like it scales linearly with the duration. So let's look at a simple conceptual model. We've got a penny-shaped crack model. We have a rupture that starts and grows. We have this circular rupture patch on our fault with radius r. We can calculate the stress drop. Uh, there's some constants here. The g is the modulus, or what is the stiffness or rigidity of the rock. U bar is the mean slip on our fault patch, and r is the radius of that. We calculate the moment of an earthquake by multiplying those quantities together, the modulus, the mean slip, and then the area of the fault. And with a little bit of simple geometry, we know what the area of this is. We have some nice simple geometry, that's why we chose it. So we can combine those and get that the moment is proportional to radius cubed. I'm going to blow through some algebra here, so not all that important, that follow every step. But the key thing is here, the velocity of the rupture is the radius divided by the duration of this event. So that's how long it lasts. Once again, we do a little bit of algebra, and we get this ugly looking thing here. A lot of these are constants, so we will get rid of them. Moment is proportional to the cube of duration with this model. Very simple model. That, that's great. We can follow that for a normal earthquake. But what about a slow earthquake? So let's say that we have this patch that's expanding again. And before it reaches its critical patch size, so as these patches grow, the crack grows, it becomes less stiff, and it's more likely to become unstable. Before it can get to that point where it's large enough and de-stiffened enough to have a regular earthquake, its size is limited. Maybe this is heterogeneity on the fault. Maybe this is some feedback mechanism in the system. Maybe it's a material property. Something limits the size. And then, instead of continuing to grow, we get a rupture front that propagates down the fault zone from this. And now, the geometry of the problem has changed. We have ruptured this entire patch. So let's do the same algebra again. Start out the same relations. Now area is not so simple. It is this length times width of this patch that we ruptured. So we do a little bit more algebra. We know that the velocity of the rupture <coughs> is this length divided by how long it took to rupture for this slow event. And we get this relation, which has a couple more terms in it. But you'll notice we have moment and duration. So moment is linearly proportional to duration with this model of a patch that grows and then has a rupture front that moves out from it because it never got big enough to become fully unstable. The other thing about the propagation velocity, we've done some experiments. These are very recent, so pretty much hot off the presses, where we've sheared the our little fault at 30 microns a second here, we're getting unstable behavior. And I increase the speed I'm pushing at, and it becomes stable. I can drop the speed back down, and now it's unstable. This makes intuitive sense, but it's not predicted by the numerics that we just did. So this tells us that there's another knob that we can turn that changes the stability of the fault system that we don't understand. And the reason I really like doing these things in the lab is because it is a literal knob that we can turn, and we can reproduce this over and over and over again. So we can span this entire spectrum by changing the velocity, too. So now we have stiffness and velocity, and this is going to get complicated. At 300 or 100 microns a second driving velocity, we're stable. As we continue to slow down, we get larger and larger slow events. Here at 3 microns a second, we even get period doubling coming in. So all of a sudden, all these complicated behaviors are back, and there's another variable in if we plot some of this data up, we can see that the velocity controls the friction drop in a log linear way. Now here we don't have any friction drop, we're stable. So this should remind you of this friction drop normal stress plot where I said there was some scaling there. Or stiffness on that axis if you want to think of it that way. So that tells us that stability space is this complex multi-dimensional space. Maybe we can plot stiffness on one axis, velocity on one axis. Your favorite stability parameter here, A minus B, or K sub C, or kappa, or whatever you want to plot it as, they're all related. But we have this uh, stability blob, or potato, that's going to be an isosurface of where we are in the stability field. So it's a lot more complex problem than those 2D plots that I showed early on. So some of what we're trying to do now 
is, well, one, run a lot more experiments with different velocities to constrain what that multidimensional stability space looks like. Also, using some new instrumentation, uh, maybe eddy current sensors or uh, capacitive distance sensors that let us get a much more accurate and higher bandwidth measurement of the fault slip, because that lets us do things like calculate laboratory moment rate functions. So we can make something that seismologists can directly connect to and makes the conversation a lot easier to have when we're connecting this to real data. We can look at things like the audible emissions from these events. We've recorded those. We have the spectra of them, see what we can learn from that, and really dive in to this energy budget problem. How does the energy budget between a fast and a slow earthquake change? We know that the slow earthquake's not putting a significant amount of energy into seismic radiation. And this is those little millikelvin level temperature anomalies that I told you we could record in the laboratory. All right, so we looked at those three fundamental questions. We'll recap them here at the very end. So what does the stability field really look like? Well, it was a complex 2D thing, and now I hope I've convinced you that it's at least a complex 3D shape. So we have a lot of controls on them. And that we can reproduce slow earthquakes in the laboratory so we can examine them over and over again in a very consistent way. And that using that laboratory data and what we know about how stiffness controls the fault zone behavior we can explain some of the things about the scaling of slow and fast earthquakes and maybe what controls the slow rupture propagation of these slow events. So in graphical form, we can go from slow at high K over K sub C to fast at low K over K sub C with these different fault geometries implied from what we've learned and use that to connect to these. We want to do that to better understand how slow earthquakes and regular earthquakes can interact on a fault zone and how the slow earthquakes could do clock advances or retards so we can better understand seismic hazard in at-risk areas. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, John. We will start with questions from students. Elizabeth, please. So the biggest limit limitation would be we're dealing with a homogeneous material that is almost never what we're going to be dealing with in nature, right? So the physics shouldn't change. That's why we like using it because, once again, we think the same frictional dynamics are going to apply to everything. But it would be nice if we could have an actual heterogeneous fault zone to do the experiments on. But for that, we need something a lot bigger. Uh, that brings up uh, there's a, a limitation with this entire system of our fault is 4 by 4 inches. So we're limited in the complexity that we can put in there. And we're actually affected some by boundary effect because we can't get a fully contained rupture. Our rupture ruptures the whole thing every time. Uh, so being able to go a little bit bigger and have heter heterogeneous materials would be ideal, but we just can't do that in a setup. Yeah. I'm wondering if, um, uh, if whether the, the, the materials being pushed or pulled makes a difference. You know, with your analog model, you have the spring pulling and it's just sticking, and I'm imagining that it may not be symmetrical if you're pushing on the spring from the other side, and I'm and then thinking about whether or not the displacement time, even with slow earthquake observations, might give you a sense of forces on the plate, pulling versus pushing. I mean, if we say it's a, just a linear elastic system, it shouldn't make a huge difference whether we're pushing or pulling in that experiment. It's set up that way. It's a simple way to set up the analog. In terms of slow earthquakes, it would be interesting to see what we could get in terms of a force balance, but I don't know that we could get very, very far with that analysis, though. Go ahead, please. So in your subduction zone, you showed towards the beginning of, beginning of your talk, you had areas that were sort of definitely earthquake, areas that were, uh, and, and then on the edges of that is where we're talking about the sort of transition type behavior. Um, you, you went into it a little bit towards the end, but I want, what's your intuition about how easy it is to kick the system into one behavior or another in the real world? Um, is it based on stress from adjacent things? Is it based on what material is getting down there? Is it, um, can it just go sort of back and forth from some random process? What's your intuition on that? Well, so the material getting down there is gonna be a huge factor because that determines what the rate state parameters are. 
I would think though that the size of the kick that you get so from a real earthquake when you've got a rupture propagating up, you've got a significant step function in the velocity, right? The stuff just sitting there minding its own business, and then there's a rupture coming along and tries to go through it. So the material is going to change rate of state parameters, which changes how it behaves in relation to that rupture. So anything that's even close to being unstable for such a large perturbation, I would think would go ahead and at least propagate the rupture, probably not stop it. But once you get to something that is stable, very shallow sediment, uh, then there's probably going to start arresting the rupture. Because we know we can get rupture all the way to trench, the trench in line again. So I guess, yeah. uh, kind of continue to sort of clarify what I was asking. Um, so then, you know, I think a lot about stress changes too. And you talked about how things like normal stress change critical stiffness, um, which obviously happens when other deformations occurring in a subduction zone. Um, presumably, there's also some shear stress effects too on what's going on. Um, and, and do you think the magnitudes of those are enough to change the stability of your system? I don't know if they're going to be enough to change the stability of the system. They're going to change things like how fast the system heals and some parameters like that. But no, I don't think it's going to significantly change the stability of the system. Okay. Nick, go ahead. So I'm, I'm trying to think about your model that uses the geometry as a rupture propagation to try and explain the scaling. And you just kind of pointed out the fact that your lab continues slip events always rupture your entire surface. And so their propagation is radial effectively until you know propagates across your entire surface. How do you rectify the fact that you're not looking at you can generate both stable and unstable sliding, but you don't have this difference because your propagation is stable? Right. So we are in this bounded system, right? We can't get a fully contained rupture. But basically what happens is we don't have a radial propagation in our laboratory system. Since we're so much more in the critical patch size, the entire thing starts creeping and then the entire patch goes basically at once. So we're getting these slow events just because of where we are, how close we are to stability transition, uh, but we're not getting any of the propagation effects. So I think if we tried to produce the scaling plot 